going oh, live. Oh. All right. All right. All right. I will go on mute. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, everybody, for the virtual Macomb meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. I am the president for this year, Diane Hall. I am getting over a cold, so I'll try to restrict talking tonight, but I do have a, a brief of report. Uh, Cranbrook's hybrid meeting, I think, was a raving success. We were able to work out the technical difficulties that hampered the live stream and the virtual participation last time while still having a good meeting and a safe meeting in the space at Cranbrook. I had the pleasure of accompanying several um, members to the red coat afterwards. Um, only I think six of us, but they were people who either had not been able to participate virtually for the various limitations of the virtual medium. Somebody new, uh, a returning member, Adrian or treasurer, and it was great. It was um, just felt like a really good um, validation of going back to, you know, the way things were, except that the red coat now closes at 1030 or rather they stopped cooking food at 1015. So um, we'll have to make some adjustments as we. Uh, uh, keep on with the live meetings at Cranbrook. Um, wrapping up at 930 instead of 10 definitely helps. So I, um, well, the board will talk that over at our next meeting, but, uh, we can't just have people trickling in the door at 11 o'clock like we used to anyway, but it was good. So, um, and of course we'll still, we're still doing the virtual meetings for the Macomb nights. So good to see you all tonight. Um, in other news, we have the picnic coming up. It'll be advertised in the uh, June, July and August wasps. We will be sending out email blasts, but if you take notes, we are going to be having it on the fourth Saturday of August. It will be the same night as our normal observing night. So an open house will follow if the weather is clear. Dinner will be at uh, five o'clock. So the board and anybody who'd like to volunteer with setup will be meeting at four at the pavilion. We'll have dinner at five. Hopefully follow that with some observing. Um, we're going back to the old format. So it'll be, uh, we will be providing burgers, dogs, veggie equivalent thereof, buns and soft drinks and ice plus condiments. Um, please bring a dish, either a side dish or a dessert to pass. Um, you know, it can be a bag of Doritos. Just don't everybody bring Doritos. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing y'all and having a good time there at our pavilion mm -hmm. down by the river. And, um, we've got astronomy at the beach is coming up. It is not too early to think about volunteering for that. Bob has the link available to post in the chat if you want to check it out. I would also like to put in a word for Stellafane. That is the uh, visual observing only star party from the Springfield Telescope Makers in Vermont. We have talked about it in the past. It's been the subject of some of Jim Shedlowski's full length talks. If you are interested in going to Stella Fane, and my partner Jonathan and I will be there for the first time ever this year, it's the final weekend in July. Um, there's still flights available. If you want to go into Burlington, there are still hotel rooms available. There are not many rental cars. So if you are thinking of making this the year that you show up at Stella Fane, I highly recommend at least book a rental car real soon. Okay, over to you at um, programs, Bob. Hi there, I'm Bob Tremblay, uh, your first vice president. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Diane mentioned Astronomy at the Beach. I sent out a mailer to the uh, club membership. If you did not get that, um, well, we need to get your email address. Uh, I'll update it MailChimp. The link to that mailer is in chat, as is a link to the Astronomy at the Beach website. Uh, it will be uh, September 16th and 17th. The uh, speaker will be Nicole Zellner. She is a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System ambassador and a, ambassador and a planetary scientist. Uh, a long time ago, I, I knew she used to work on lunar samples, and so uh, she's got uh, she's doing a lecture. And I, I saw an email going to the GLAC board today about other other lectures she could do, and I said, "Hey, any of those ones you're not going to be doing for astronomy at the beach? I have somewhere you could do them. So let's see if she can do some for us." Um, other than that, um, I think that's pretty much it. All right, our second vice president, Observatory Chair Riyad, is driving, so he asked us to present his report um, in lieu of, you know, him doing it. So, a uh, Stargate for May 28th, 2022, observatory opened at 7.33. The sky was cloudy and did not improve. Over 20 members of the general public attended. Some of them are interested in joining WAS. We are going to mention this again with regard to outreach, but people are hungry for in person astronomy. If you've not made a habit of going out to Stargate or you've not um, been signing up for outreach events, I expect that we are going to have a lot of demand this summer. So uh, it might be a good idea to send an email to outreach at warrenastro.org, get on the outreach report, or let Riyadh know that you're coming out to join him on an open house night. Most of the activities consist of showing off all our wonderful equipment and answering questions and two new pieces of equipment, the two by 20 by 54 millimeter ultra wide field binoculars that we've purchased and the new ZWO atmospheric dispersion corrector are safely in place at the observatory. Riyadh was out there until 11, 12 PM with the 20 people. The next open house will be June 25th at 730. And that will also be the meeting of the double star group. So hopefully y'all can make it. Over to you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Um, the only thing I have to report, I was over at the Warren Library today and uh, their program, uh, the Library Telescope program is, uh, uh, their scopes are being checked out uh, weekly. So that's really good. And today I, uh, uh, I did some, uh, what do you want to call it? Facebook videos that they took of how to use the library telescope. Um, and I think that went pretty well, although I think the majority of the videos might wind up. I don't know if they have like a, a YouTube blooper channel, but uh, they could wind up on that. But anyway, it was informative. So that way, uh, you know, the member, uh, the people at the. Sorry. We lost your sound there for a moment, Mark. Would you like me to re repeat my report? I'm I'm getting uh iffy. Last um, last sentence at least. What was the last sentence? I'm not sure. I don't have any notes. <laughs> I think my last sentence was that's all I have to report. <laughs> uh, okay, it was about the library. <laughs> oh, the library. Okay, I just, I just did. I tell you that I did. Uh, they did some videos, instructional videos to how to use the library telescope. So we, we did like a series of videos that they could, uh, they're gonna post on the library website. And uh, they, I think they turned out pretty well, although some of them will wind up on a blooper channel. So we didn't do any editing, but uh, but it, it definitely, the library's happy with them. So Absolutely. that's all I have to report. Very good. All right, I don't see Kevin. So in his stead, I'll mention outreach wise, We've got, um, we were not, of course, able to do our grand return to Cranbrook with the lunar eclipse because of clouds and rain. Um, we are getting requests for quite a few uh, scouting events up there at Cut Mill outside the normal hours of uh, our open houses on the fourth Saturday of the month. So if you are interested in doing outreach, Please send Kevin an email, outreach at warrenaster.org. Get on the radar. 
um, so that he uh, knows that you are ready to serve. And with that, over to, there you are, Dale. Hello, Diane. Um, just uh, reporting that the WASP is online and uh, working on the next issue already. And also a little bit of a reminder for people to uh, submit their astro photos, uh, uh, astro drawings, whatever, to uh, publications at warnastro.org so we can start working on uh, our next calendar. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dale. Yes, we are halfway through the year. So we are looking to assemble a great calendar um, early so that we can hand them out personally um, as soon as possible at a Winter Cranbrook meeting. We are, of course, already looking out for the nominating committee because many officers, including my, me, are termed out for our constitution. And um, we are doing a banquet. Um, so yeah, big things. Picnics, calendars, officers. Time to step up and ha join the fun. And with that, I would like to open it to observing reports. And I see two hands up from Dr. Levy coming in from New Mexico. Yes, sir. We can't hear you. We need to turn the. I hope that's better. That's I'll way better, David. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you. It's good to be here. But I wanted to say that I actually am from. I am actually from Arizona, and uh, where the temperature now is about 105, and we're on the verge of starting our summer storm season, and uh, supposed to go out to observe tomorrow night, but. Um, doesn't look like it's going to be very effective with the summer storms coming in. I wanted to describe a little bit about the uh, Tau Herculid meteor shower, the meteor shower that wasn't. Wendy and I went outside, we were all there, and we sat and we sat and we waited and we waited. We got a total of 19, 18 meteors instead of 18 million meteors. And uh, so the next day, I just, you know, I typically have a fisheye lens taking pictures, and it's lucky if I get one of those meteors recording. I found out the next day that I got five, including two meteors on a single frame. And the reason that I got so many of them on camera is that these meteors were very, very slow. And they kind of moved, really took their time going through the sky. And that was really such a surprise. And I'm writing a bit about it for the uh, newsletter. The newsletter should be getting in a day or two. For my quotation this month, I'm going to one of my favorite poets, Robert Frost. He was the unofficial poet laureate of the United States when John Kennedy. Uh, was inaugurated as president, and he had written a poem for that occasion, but he couldn't read it because the sun was shining so brightly on his podium. So he did another one uh, just from memory. And the poem that I'm going to read to you today is my favorite Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, 
I doubt it if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads merged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you, back to you, Diane. Thank you. Speaking of taking the road less traveled by, has anybody been up at four in the morning to look for all of the planets in the sky at once? I see Ken. Uh, yeah. My plan up. is to first. Yeah, my plan is to hit it on the 22nd next week when they're all going to be in a line and the moon will be in the middle of the lineup. Nice. See what I can get. So that's well, my we, plan. We've been up. Uh, I see Catherine in the chat says I was up this morning, had to be at work extra early. So I killed two birds with one stone. Yeah, Jonathan and I went out driving along Michigan Avenue, which is our best mobile um east west horizon and uh mercury was in a cloud bank so there was the moon there was saturn peeping in and out of clouds there was jupiter a faint mars and venus and then right at the horizon where there should have been mercury five degrees above the horizon mm. no we also <laughs> made an attempt uh, a couple days ago i want to say it was last friday um pristine skies above lake huron absolutely gorgeous venus and jupiter just blazing in the dark sky and mercury was not it was like negative one below the horizon or something like that back on the 10th so no no dice but um good good tip adrian you said the 22nd yeah, it's somewhere between like the 21st and the 24th, I believe, Mercury gets above the horizon during um, nautical twilight heading into civil, which yes. um, you've, you've basically got about a 15 to 20 minute time frame from what I can tell where all the planets will be up and the moon will be there too, but there will be you know glowing uh light will be changing by the minute and um you know that a lot of the other stars are going to start washing out the fainter planets uranus and neptune will wash out so um all the visible planets should be there for you to um visually see as far as taking pictures i think it'll be a little tougher but you'll see them all and then i think gradually that Mercury will wash out. Yeah. All the planets will begin to wash out as the sun just comes up and dominates everything. So, so if you're interested, you in if, you if you're up in the morning and you're interested in catching Uranus and Neptune, Uranus is hanging out right by Venus. They were basically in conjunction a few days ago. I have not been able to detect it using the eight by forty-two bird watching binoculars in the pre-dawn conditions, but I'm sure any of you all with a telescope trained at Venus, you'll you'll pick it up. Mars is what Adrian in or Neptune is in between Jupiter and Saturn right now. I think so. I'm That'll gonna... be tricky. That'll be tricky yeah. in any circumstance. And the moon, the moon and Uranus are close too. So <sighs> on the the day I want to do it, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty tricky. But um, especially with the light of the moon as it's coming up, so that's gonna that'll play a little bit of a role. But um. I still think there's, um, still waning, think there's an image there. Is that a waning crescent? A waning uh, gibbous, isn't it? On the twenty second. Waning gibbous, yeah. Okay. Waning gibbous. I thought it was. It got at least to a waning crescent. Has it passed over to a crescent by the? I guess so. If it's already the. It be, well, it's yeah, it's full, a waning full, gibbous full, right now. Yeah. yeah. Full 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 uh, moon was a couple of days ago, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. It'll be it'll be a waning moon regardless, and not anywhere near full. So. Yeah, so that's your challenge object uh, for the month, everybody. See if you can knock them all out. Any there other observing go. reports? Unmute well, yourself and speak because I can't see everybody right now. Yeah, I um, I also saw one. I captured one of the uh, Tau Herculids. It's I'll only show 
one picture of me capturing a Tal Herculid if I see it in the next couple minutes in front of me. If I don't, I won't worry about it. Oh, there it goes. Um, really quickly, and then we'll... Yeah, that's it. So, so there is... Um, there's one lone Tau Herculid that happened to start as I was taking uh, taking an exposure. Milky Way over the lake, common com composition for Milky Way shooting, and then this slow Tau Herculid started going. The exposure actually stopped before this meteor um, finished burning up. If I had left it on a few seconds more, I would have had another a longer line going but uh so this is that and if i saw a few others i think this is maybe the only image i took that whole night that actually had a tal herculid in it so uh david you you've won five to one in your uh images so uh that was it um I also, before everyone got on, I talked about how bright our the lowbrow university lowbrow observing site has be, has become because there is a bright light for um, motion and vandalism. They're they're trying to stop vandalism on the property, and as a result, we have less space on Peach Mountain to observe. So it's kind of a trade off. We didn't want to didn't want but we understand you know they're trying to prevent i actually have a picture of the big tower there the radio tower with a graffiti tag almost almost all the way up the tower on one of the um on one part of the tower you can see a graffiti tag there so wow. you know, something has to be done and that's my observing report all right who else? We've had a few clear days. I put a couple of uh, links up in the chat. Oh, very uh, good. I got an image of Jupiter and Saturn over the weekend uh, with an eight inch, went up to the lake house up in uh, Harrison and got some images. I also got one of the ring nebula that I haven't processed yet without my focal reducer. So the full eight inch uh, OTA and uh, like I said, without a uh, focal reducer on there. Definitely pulled in a little more, a uh, little more detail, but I'll uh, I'll send that out to the group if you want. But I haven't processed it yet. But just yeah. a rough stack. It looked pretty slick. I was real happy with how it turned out. So very nice. Thank you for sharing. Who else? All right. Well, we've got a couple of subgroups to report. Um, <laughs> uh. Solar news. Solar Marty is not with us tonight, though he has been attending Cranbrook meetings, which it's good to see him. Anybody got a shot of the sun to share? I'm an up. Should add it up. All right. Like I said, double. Well, Bob pulls that up. Double Star is meeting at the open houses on the fourth Saturday. We've got um, discussion group is still in hiatus. We put out some feelers. Haven't got any volunteers yet. Did get some feedback from membership that they felt it was too early to be hanging around in somebody's house eating um, snacks together, which I do understand that, though, you know, we could also do it outdoors, which wouldn't be substantially different from the picnic. So we're still working on how to resurrect discussion groups safely. Um, history subgroup, as always, gets chronicled in the WAS. And. S. Astronomical League. Adrian. It's me. Um, so Astronomical League, this is, these are the last couple of weeks. If you haven't already included your dues to renew your Astronomical League membership, um, I will be sending in the spreadsheet at the end of this month with the uh, list of um, people that I have who have paid for another year of Astronomical League membership. So if you are an Astronomical League member in another club, then it's okay. You can be, you can, you only have to pay once to be a member. 
um, I withdrew my membership from the low browse in order to become a member through was since I'm the, uh, the liaison for um, the was here. So um, if you have any questions, I'll put the email in the chat. Um, send, it, send it to the official account treasurer at rornastro.org. We're going to give us a, uh, uh, a mailing address as well if we want to send a check. Um, the P.O. box for the club. Okay, good. Thank you. And and what you can do is if you send the check, <clears throat> you can still send me an email and say, okay. I sent you a check because I'll still include your name and make sure that uh, payment, because we'll, we'll send the name and payment. Remind me of the price, 750? Uh, 750. That's what I heard. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. And so that's it. There are some Astronomical League. I think there's a, um, I think there's a talk that's coming up by Dr. Caitlin Ahrens. Um, that um here we go astro league.org um yeah let me just quickly i'll do this and get out of everyone's way um so here you go astro league.org this would be a good place to go to get more information about what the astronomical league is doing and this is the uh, talk that coming up tomorrow, um, Dr. Caitlin Ahrens is going to be talking about the geology of Mars. Um, <clears throat> you might recognize this name. Uh, <laughs> some guy named David Levy, someone I love to call David, will also be um, online tomorrow. Um, check out the Astronomical League's Facebook page. Um, for information on where to um, follow. I believe that's where they'll be streaming this event. And um, there's more, there was actually a uh, Tal Hercules uh, observing program that um, they put on the website. Of course, that's already passed, but um, other observing programs are here. So looking to um, extend your, if you are an Astronomical League member, here are some of the things available, um, including an online version of the reflector, which they have here. And a picture that I wish was mine, but it's not mine. <laughs> so that is, um, that is it for the Astronomical League. And any questions you have, you can send also to that treasure at warrenastro.org email that will reach me. And back to you, Madam President. Madam President. Hey. I'm getting a lot of um, uh, feedback. I think somebody who's people who aren't doing the reports could mute the mic. It's it's dear dear. Deidre. Yeah, mute yourself, Deidre. She was cleaning her. You were cleaning your glasses. We. It, I it was. was a, what do you want yeah, me to do? That's a mistake. Just if you can um, hit the mute button for a bit, because we're it's coming over very loud on the microphone. Thank oh. you. Oh, um, by the way, oh, let's do a treasury report since we missed it really quickly. We have thirty-one thousand dollars in the bank. And um we also have the capability of um repaying or reimbursing um electronically, um whether through PayPal, which is at around uh fourteen hundred or um through normal checks since we did uh pick up the checkbook from cranbrook which was safely stored away from us and won't be ever left there again um so that is it for the quick and short treasures report very good and uh anybody thing from the astronomical image community doug All bad. Okay. Well, with that, I'd like to declare our 15 minute snack break so you can turn off your cameras, mute your mics, and we will reconvene in 15 minutes for our feature presentation. All right. See you then. All righty. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, talk about something I was doing today. Um, 
my boss has me uh, writing a, a post about, uh, okay, re, 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 <clears throat> restart. Every other year, the Vatican Observatory runs the Vatican Observatory Summer School, and they have some fairly big name people in as the faculty and stuff. And I'm copying faculty information off the off the off the post for what I'm doing. And there's the post I copied it from. Now this first person here, I'm gonna kill her name, Viviana Ak. Aquaviva, I can't pronounce her last name. Anyway, I'm looking at it. She's an astrophysicist and she's got qualifications up the yin yang. She's been recognized as a role model for women in science and she's been listed as one of the, in Italy, as the 50 women doing history of computer science. And the whole thing about the summer school, the the the, uh, the theme of it is big data. And, and uh, the tagline here is, uh, astronomical data is entering into the petabyte domain. And so these guys are going to be talking about uh, an image analyzing using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, and stuff like that. And I'm just looking at the list of, of people uh, doing instructions here, and it's all like big brains. And I'm like, I wonder how I can become indispensable to Brother Guy and have him take me with him because I want to meet every single one of these people. But uh, yikes. So these 25 students are going to be real lucky when they uh, when they when they do this next summer. But uh, yeah, big data was something I got interested in. Uh, when I first became a solar system ambassador, and they 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 did, uh, I attended a lecture about the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, and the mission specialist said, you know, the great thing about the lunar reconnaissance orbiter is it's generating lots and lots of data, and he says the bad thing about the lunar reconnaissance orbiter is it's generating lots and lots of data, and there's so much they had to they had to create two separate. Uh, citizen science programs to you know analyze little patches of the moon, and that worked great. But you know some of these things like uh, like like uh, the Gaia and Pan stars and stuff like that are generating just e freaking enormous amounts of data. And how are you going to analyze that? And it's only going to get worse because you know more and more objects are being observed. So yikes. So big data is is something I I I think I'd like to get somebody to talk about that because uh, the the concept has interested me for a while and it's I'm st I've just over the last few months even I've just seen more and more instances of it especially relating to astronomy and astrophysics. But anyway, yielding the floor. Bob, I'm still trying to set up this uh, PayPal account for Glack. It has been... <laughs> Don't kill yourself tonight, man. Oh, it'll work. I mean, it's... It's not going to be... have to contact it. John and see it's what almost, it is. It's almost done, it. actually. Almost almost there. Almost there. It was, I was in Phoenix, by the way, this last week. And uh, I brought the heat back with me to Detroit, so... Thanks. I mean, Thanks for that. It was in my bag. It was 113 degrees there. And, uh, but the skies were perfectly clear. And you know what I did is I took my, um, my little, my small binoculars, the one that I got from, uh, from, uh, uh Dale, uh, that, uh, uh, turned out to be, uh, really nice out there. I didn't, I didn't take my other binoculars and take a telescope, but, uh, skies were clear. But it was really hot. I'm talking hot, hot. And people keep saying, well, <laughs> well, it's dry heat. There's no such thing as dry heat. It's all heat. <laughs> so it's all heat. It's all heat. It was like it was really, really, really hot. And um, so, but it was a nice trip down there. I went over to the astronomy department at the University of Arizona when I drove down to Tucson, where the Lunar and Planetary Lab used to be. There's now a, a a uh, planetarium, but the old telescope um, uh, dome is still sitting there in the middle of campus. Um, 
and uh, it was really nice. I walked in there, I, you know, I'm an alumnus of the University of Arizona, and the guy at the desk said, no, go ahead and tour the museum. It usually costs $7, but you're an alumnus, and you could just do it. So I went through the museum, very nice. It's nice. Cool. Yeah. It was it was great seeing my old alma mater again. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was uh, it was the trip was called the agony and the ecstasy because the flight was canceled on the way back and I had to take a red eye. And uh, oh, that happened to a friend of ours. And I had a and I had a rental car from from uh, Enterprise that uh, uh, an Italian scientist needs to drive that car. It's got too many bells and whistles on it. It connected great with my phone from Phoenix to Tucson, but it wouldn't connect on the way back. And it beeped at me and it said, push uh, the edit button. And there was no edit button. You know, I, you know, it was like, it was, it was pretty scary, actually. But it was a great trip. I saw my sister and nieces and that was great. A week in Phoenix. So you're all going to blame me if you're in Michigan. For the heat wave we just had, because it was in my bag on the way back. Well, my daughter called from Texas today, and it's sweltering down there. Yeah, so. it's absolutely. They're getting killed everywhere. It's 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 really, really, really hot. Um, and uh, you know, we'll do what we got to do, I guess. Anyway, it's great to be back. So I, I put a link to the uh, NASA moon phase and libration page. I, I use it to get daily pictures of the moon. I use it for my post and I have a shortcut to it on my desktop. And so there's a little moon on my desktop and my granddaughter comes up here wandering around by my desk and she sees that and goes moon. And I'm like, really? So two years old, she knows what the moon is. I wonder, I wondered when that would happen, but uh, she remembers it and knows it. Can't get her interested in the sun though. Doesn't understand what all that stuff is when I'm showing it to her because it doesn't look like that bright thing in the sky, you know, so. Right. Later. We'll get that to her later. I, I really had a, I had a great meeting um, at, um, uh, at the uh, library. I mentioned it to you last month uh, about the, I did the thing about the life and death of a star and, uh, they had about a hundred people there. I guess it was close to a hundred. Anyway, the questions were terrific, and um, it was. That's about uh, what I had when I did mine, and they were from all over the world, which it, like it, sort of shocked me. It was amazing. It was so much fun, and these kids were they, a lot. Of, most of them were kids, and you know, I'm talking about teenagers or young adults, and they were asking terrific questions. I, it looked like they had a script. That's how good it looked. So, anyway, that was that was a lot of fun too. And uh, so everything was uh, was a great trip. Super. So I uh, um, kind of I gave my presentation on the decadal survey last time, and I'm going to be giving more of them. And uh, I contacted two of the people on the Mars Life Explorer, and uh, <laughs> um, she's talking about. Uh, you know, this, this, the, the, the concept is the Mars Life Explorer is going to be searching for extant life on Mars. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, well, okay, so what ha And I asked her this. I said, what happens if we find life? I mean, we're going to want to study it, right? So we're going to study it with robots, obviously. But what about a sample return of that life to Earth? And I went upstairs and asked my mother-in-law, and I says, okay, Ma, if we find life on Mars, how would you feel about a sample return of that life to Earth to study? And she did this. I said, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, that, that's the that's the probably the right answer. So no on the life sample return. But then I got to thinking, all right, that they're going to be doing some, they're planning on doing Mars sample returns. Um, what if there's life in that? I mean, is there a quarantine procedure? Did you see the Did you see the pic, Did you see the pictures the last couple of days about the junk on Mars? There's a <clears> couple <throat> of pictures that just were put out that said the junk on Mars. Junk on Mars. The junk, junk on oh, Mars, right. and I'm trying to figure <laughs> out like... what kind of junk could be on Mars. <laughs> well, so they uh, rocket debris and and other pieces of the missions. The helicopter found the aeroshell okay. all smashed up. Yeah, I mean it's it's just the debris field from our human activity there. 
Yeah, that, that, that was great. I was Somebody was saying, well, that must be life on, you know, I said, that, that's yeah, not how it works. Human garbage. It certainly looks like our junk, as it were. June 5th. Yeah, there it is. All right, I'll post a link. I found it. Yeah, okay. In chat. Mars yeah. Perseverance rover captures images of its own litter. Oh, that was well. well okay, I just it, thought it did. Figured. It did that when it dropped the helicopter. I mean, it, that that whole black plastic undercarriage thing dropped and they left it there. Yeah, well, that sounds okay. <laughs> my buddy's got, <laughs> my buddy's got a bumper sticker that says "Earth first. It says we'll screw up the rest of the planets later. Yeah, the truth. So yeah, I know. Did you see? Did you see the picture of the uh, uh, helicopter finding the aero shell all smashed up? I didn't see that. Ooh, I'll go find that. We lost you. Yeah, we lost you. Sorry. Uh, Debris field. Oh, there we go. I posted it in chat. Debris field from Perseverance landing gear seen from Mars helicopter and the air shells all smashed up and you could see the uh, parachute. Man, I hope that helicopter survives winter. Well, Bob, I started the PayPal account, but I'll need to get some more info from the stuff we have on when we started the account uh, for GLAC before we can fully, I can give you the link. But uh, we're, it's almost done. So we're, we, we made a little bit of progress. Cool. Thank you. John asked a question in chat where uh, they were, uh, oh, that's not a question. They were able to detect wind force watching it. I'm not sure what you mean by that, John. Uh, what happened was that they saw a piece of debris that, well, had a bunny-like shape to it, but they knew roughly the weight of the piece of debris by its size and what they knew the material was, so they could detect by its movement, because it was moving slowly when they were watching it, they, they could detect uh, what sort of force of wind was going on at the time based on the amount of movement that the little bunny made. It was uh, one of the earliest uses of debris, <laughs> observed debris. Yeah, it was really cool when that, uh, when the heat shield fell away and you could see all of the instrumentation and stuff on it and how one of the clasps was actually like flopping free and they weren't expecting <laughs> that and so they're, they're very glad that they got those images and well very, those images from public cameras that weren't supposed to be there in the first place but so i actually don't <laughs> i don't understand why they don't put cameras on absolutely everything looking absolutely everywhere i mean they're tiny and yeah uh, it's cheap too now <laughs> Yeah. 
NASA was taking a lot of guff on uh, <laughs> on uh, on Twitter about the InSight lander and uh, all all the uh, the solar panels covering with dust. People saying, "Why couldn't you just like send a toothbrush along with it? You know, just brush it off with that arm." And they were they were saying real hard about you know how weight weight stuff and systems integration and i'm like you could put a couple brushes on there and it wouldn't add much weight at all <laughs> yeah i, did, I, I just, just spin it i just hope they don't run into a do not litter sign down there that's all <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a scientist that i think their uh, um, sh her whole job description is basically uh figuring out how to absolutely sterilize the landers before they go out uh, <laughs> good luck with that yikes yeah they 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 estimate that on every one of these probes that does land that even though they're doing everything they can there's probably going to be about uh you know about a hundred organisms or so on the lander somewhere and then probably one or two of those are going to be viable which means uh you know whatever it, it, it if the if a lander is in a environment where it doesn't really get relatively large amounts of radiation you, you, the organisms might survive or be viable for a while i don't think they'll reproduce or anything but. very interesting to finally you know have something see the old Viking lander. Yeah, it's covered with red dust and it's also covered with green stuff all over the place. <laughs> yeah, when you when you talk about the sample return, I believe they've already um built the lab that um would deal with the Mars return samples. Yeah, I got I got a response from the lady who, an article about that. I, I got a response from the lady who was talking about that and she was talking about mm -hmm. the uh, uh UNESCO, you know, you, the peaceful you, you uh treaty for the peaceful use of space and I'm thinking of the size of, does that have quarantine procedures in it for extraterrestrial it, it, returns? Uh yeah, it, it it's similar to the lunar I'm labs gonna... where they have uh um, containment that uh, that has a certain pressure value, so there's no air that goes into the thing, and there's no air that goes out. Uh, I, I forget exactly how they do it, but it's like three rings of different air pressure. I'm going to have and, to research that. Yeah, right. and the reason for that is the same for the moon uh, uh, labs, is basically to keep the samples pure. Uh, uh, from contamination, and it kind of works both ways. Okay, we got so, to start back up. Come different. back to a fascinating discussion, but it is time for me to call the meeting back to order, yield the floor to Bob to introduce our speaker, and then sit back and enjoy the feature presentation. All right, Bob, over to you. I close all these windows I have on here. All right, our, our speaker tonight is Deirdre Kelligan. Uh, she's coming to us from Ireland. So it's like really, really late where she is. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, Deirdre was one of the first people that Brother Guy had me create a uh, uh, an author account on the Vatican Observatory Foundation's website years ago, and she's been posting stuff ever since then, and it's all uh, all of her astronomical drawings and stuff, and she does a lot of stuff with children, which I, I'd like to see us. Well, we do a lot of stuff with children, but um, she's her website, which I will post a, a link in here. Uh, she's uh, like members of a lot of different organizations has been awarded by a lot of things. And I was just like, I'm reading it going, oh, my goodness. So she's very active. And I, uh, I, I hooked up with her about a month ago to, to check to make sure we can get WebEx working. And, and let me tell you right now, she's absolutely delightful. So I am absolutely thrilled Charmer. to have her here. Oh, my goodness. I'm thrilled to have her here and take it away, Deirdre. Okay. Um, well, just before I share my um, presentation, just uh, hello from the west coast of Ireland. Um, I'm here in County Mayo, 
right on the edge of the Atlantic, literally just uh, about 15 minutes walk from my house. Um, we have the waves crashing in, um, which is advantageous at times and uh, horrendous at other times, you know, because we get like fierce winds and lots of rain, mist, uh, you name it, any kind of precipitation we got <laughs> most of the time, any season. So I'll just uh, share this now with you. And uh, let me just get this up. I hope it'll go as well. Screen. Now, you can see that? Yes, we can. Uh, there is somebody and talking. You can can you, other than yes. Deirdre, can you please mute? Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine, Deirdre. And we can, you can we see can the presentation. See. So yes, we I'll can. get going on it now. Yep. And uh, let me just take note of the time because I'll go off on the tangent and, and you'll have to shut me up. Um, so this is a kind of a an overview or a little kind of window into the type of things you can do with astronomical drawing. You can basically draw anything if you put your mind to it. And, you know, with children in particular, and with anybody really, it actually doesn't matter whether you're good at drawing or not good at drawing, um, to make an effort to draw the moon or a nebula or whatever it is. In doing that, you're learning about the object, no matter whether your drawing is very simple or very complex. Um, I did a book some years ago with three Americans and one English friend. So Richard Handy, Thomas McCaig, Erica Ricks uh, were the Americans, and a friend of mine uh, from the UK, Sally Russell. And the five of us got together and produced Sketching the Moon, an Astronomical Guide, um, which was a lot of work um, and a great learning curve. Um, and if you're thinking of looking at it, I would say check out the ebook because the images are much more precise and much more realistic to the original drawings. Um, I occasionally do some articles and drawings for Sky at Night magazine, which is a UK publication, very popular over here. Um, I had a drawing of Comet Neowise in Sky and Telescope back in uh, 2000, I think it was. And, um, or sorry, in 2020. And then um, I always send, if I do a decent drawing, I always send it into orbit, not literally into orbit, but into a publication of the Irish Astronomical Society, which is an organization I've been connected with for many years. And uh, I always think of them and send them stuff. And, and they publish um, a monthly uh, magazine called Orbit. And uh, earlier on, you were mentioning David Levy. And it reminded me that I actually had a, an article on astronomical sketching in Reflector magazine. I think it might have been around 2009 or maybe after that, because I went to David's talk in Alcon, New York, in 2009 at the time. So that brought back a memory of or three or four. And these are kind of basically the tools that I use when I'm doing my drawing. The fat sticks there, or the wider ones, are soft pastels. Um, they're fabulous for blending, making marks, making very distinctive marks. And the skinnier ones over on the left are Conte sticks. They're like pastel, but they're more condensed and harder. So you get like um, a sharp edge. You get like, they're lovely for putting um, sunlight on the rims of craters when you're drawing the moon, that kind of thing. Um, the sticks on top are called silicon tipped brushes. They're kind of, they've had rubber tips on them and they're very good for spreading pastels um, in, in tiny ways or in large ways. Um, for nebula and comets, I often use cotton buds to spread the pastel, rub the, uh, the, the cotton bud on the pastel and lift the pastel and use it like that. Now, when I'm doing solar drawing, just imagine that all of those sticks are yellow and orange and red, um, and I use a combination of those for solar work. 
Uh, this is, I'm just going to show you a few of the solar drawings. Um, this is a full solar disk, which is something I wouldn't do very often because of the complexity of the sun in the H alpha. You know, this would be like a, a PST uh, telescope. Uh, in this particular drawing was done with Bino viewers, which gives you quite a 3D sort of vibe or look especially to active regions and sunspots and, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I, with the PST, it's only a 40 millimeter, the one I have. And you're seeing the solar disk as less than that. You're seeing it like a coin size. I, I don't know the size of American coins, but um, it's a probably about 20, 20 millimeters to the 40 of, of, of the circumference of the telescope. So you're seeing it as a small disk with about 500 million pieces of information to your eye, if you know what I mean, like the whole, the active regions, the, the sunspots, the prominences, if there's any, and all that, um, the millions of dots all over the sun, that the millions of fibrils that are in all kinds of shapes, according to the magnetic energy that's coming out of these active regions, and the way that is presented to your eye is almost impossible to draw the whole entire thing one of these days but i'm doing little bits and pieces to try and get me there um if there's a decent prominence on the limb of the sun that would be my target like this and um, there's a filiprom going on here so you have like a, a filament rising up from from the sun and going out into space so it kind of becomes a prominent so the word for that is philoprom um and it looks quite powerful when you're looking at it no matter how tiny it is you're looking at it and you know it's huge um but I, I i'm drawing i'm making like you know i'm looking at something that's very small but i'm drawing it the size of a dinner plate i use dinner plates to make the edges of most of my solar drawings depending on what I'm looking at. I might use a side plate, um, but a dinner plate, if the, if the, if the, the presentation of the object I'm looking at, like this hedgerow prom, was quite large and along a, a, a large area of the limb of the sun. Uh, this is another active region which I was kind of fascinated by because the umbra was very dark on the sunspot. And it was very long and elongated. It was kind of an unusual one. And it had a lot of plage, you know, the plage um, on each side. And then it had uh, filaments rising up and coming in or out. I'm never quite sure. It's often incredible to look at the sun, but you can't draw it the same size you see it. You have to elevate the size so that you can make sense of it. So you're kind of doing it to scale as you're drawing it. So this would be like a typical start of a solar limb sketch, let's say. So I, again, I've used a dinner plate to make the edge and I'm using a Conte uh, stick, which is like those little hard sticks, but with, or with an orange tone in it. I use a cheese grater to grate an orange stick, or sometimes I use a yellow stick first, and I would grate a yellow stick of soft pastel into 100 million particles. Before that, I would have sprayed the paper with a rece receiving spray glue, um, so that you know if it's windy, it won't all blow away on me for, for starters, and also to hold it to the page. Um, and I would give this a sort of an even coating if I can. And then on top of that, I would then put a, an orange layer on top of the yellow. Occasionally, I might throw in a bit of red as well. It just You're just trying to recreate the hydrogen alpha look. Um, and then, of course, the powder, the particles go over the edge, over your, your circumference of your, your drawing. So you need to do something about that. So to fix that up, I use a dinner plate. 
um, have a thing about using kitchen utensils in astronomy, put the owl um, dinner plate on top of the sun again, and I have a thing about black, so grey pages are not black enough for me, so I always use a very black soft pastel, go over the entire page, and then lift the plate. Okay, so you end up with a hydrogen alpha look, and then you have to seal it, uh, fix it. You've got to fix it with a fixative spray so that it's not moving all over the place when you're going to then apply the prominence or the active region or the filaments or whatever it is that's going on on the sun. So it's it's quite a complex process, and the drawings are quite vulnerable and tender until you finally finish them and fix it. So I intend to make a video to explain this because I don't think anybody else I know, well, I don't know of anybody else who goes about these things in such a mad way. So I hope to make a video to explain it a little better because people are not familiar with the materials or the method. So I'm going to lock it down and make a video about that. So you end up then. We, yes. have, we have a question. Uh, what's your favorite fixative? Oh, it's called um, Sennelier. It's it's a French fixative. Um, have I got one here in front of me? I have one in my press. It's a Sennelier uh, fixative. Um, I, when, I, when I'm doing astronomical drawing, I tend to use cheap uh, soft pastels, okay? But when I'm doing other drawings like animals and, and things like that. I tend to use what are called Sennelier soft pastels. They're kind of expensive French soft pastels and their fixative is the best fixative. You know, it, it's, it holds the drawing. You might have to do four or five or six um, applications till you're happy, but it's the best one ever. Um, let me see if I can get this going now. This is, this, this is what you can do if you create several drawings of prominences on the limb. Let's see if I can get that going again. Oops, go back. Oops, go back. That won't go again. Oh well. If you did six or seven prominent drawings on the limb of the sun over a period of hours, like or maybe it could be half an hour in between or an hour or whatever. But if you did a, a good few of them, then you can make, oh, you can make a, oh, it won't go, but it's, um, it's like doing a lot of, uh, so here it is. It's like doing um, still animation. You know, you do a lot of still images and then you put them, put them together in a GIF. So then over, t you cannot see the prominences moving when you're observing them. You can't see movement in them, okay? So to see the movement and see the changes of the shape and the energy and the power that's going on, you need to do several still drawings over the course of a day, if you're lucky enough to have a day that's not cloudy, and you're lucky enough to have an energetic set of proms. And then when you put them together as a gift, then you can see the movement, and, and I like doing that. And um, you can also do the same thing with comets. If you can observe a comet that appears to be fast moving, i.e., changing its location in your field of view over the course of an hour or so, well, then you could do two or three drawings of it and put them together in a GIF, and then you can see the, the comet moving. Um, as regards lunar drawing, um, I use, uh, this is called a field easel. It's like a wooden uh, easel. It has the drawer there for your pastels and it has legs. Um, it's a bit of an animal getting it in and out because the legs have, they fold and you got to lock them. And then you have to get your telescope in the right position. And, you know, the, these particular drawings were done for Sky at Night magazine. So you're doing it kind of in the middle of the night. This drawing, as far as I remember, they, it was in June. They asked me to do a drawing of the last quarter moon in June. So it doesn't get dark, you know, <laughs> in June. And, uh, you know, you're kind of 
struggling. You're starting late, very late, and you're finishing earlier than you want to because the sun is going to come up. So, um, yeah, it was an awkward time to be asked, but uh, it worked out grand, and they were happy, and they gave me a full page. So, again, uh, I'm using a dinner plate to make the uh, limb of the moon, and then I work around doing, like, little bits of everything, uh, balancing out the drawing. So starting off with the limb, then adding in the, the highlands and the, the, the lowlands and, you know, some crater shape just, just to get something started. Um, and I use my fingers a lot. And um, so when you're doing a drawing like this, you need to kind of do like something on the top, something on the bottom, something on the edge. You know, and and concentrate uh, also on the terminator, and and that's often uh, an issue because you could be doing these kind of drawings for two hours, two and a half hours, that kind of thing, and your terminator might look magnificent at the beginning, and then it depends on whether it's a waxing or a waning moon, whether you're losing light or gaining light, and it's a judgment call every time to finish if you want to change the terminator at the very end. I, I rarely do. So you're you're working away and you're working away, and you're adding some sunlight to craters that you can't even see because you can see the rims of them, you know, because the sun has caught the rim in, in the darkness. And it, to me, the Terminator is just incredible to look at, and it's incredible to draw, and it's exciting, and I absolutely love it. So I use sometimes this is this thing is called a quilling needle. It I don't know the craft, but it's something to do with curling paper and making paper look curly. Don't ask me, but um, I use it for uh, sometimes for etching, you know, for making them um, an, an area look a bit rough or removing some white if I put too much on and I change the shape of of the rim of the crater or whatever I'm drawing. And as you can see from my fingers, I get absolutely filthy doing it because the soft pastels are very soft. You know, if I scratch my nose during a drawing, I, I go in and I'm, I'm just full of black stuff and grey stuff. And um, so this was the last quarter moon sketch that I did for Sky Night magazine. And um, that was in 2015. And I remember when I was you know, it was three. I started at two fifteen UT, finished at three fifty UT, because you see, I had to wait for the moon to rise above houses that were across the road from me at the time. I lived in a housing estate. Now I live in the countryside, so I had to wait for the moon to get high enough to see it, and then, you know, at three fifty, I had to finish the drawing, even though I wanted to put more into it, because. I was, the sky was just getting bluer and bluer because the sun was rising. Uh, I was living on the east coast at the time, and you know. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes you you decide to finish a drawing because you're tired, or you decide because the sun has decided for you, or you decide because you come to a point in a drawing where you cannot do any more. You know, you've you've done enough to capture it. So uh, you know, there's a lot of Ending a drawing is a call that is made mostly by you and sometimes by uh, situations. Uh, Sinus Rhythm, I did that for uh, that book. And um, yeah, that worked out quite nice. Again, I'm using the quilling needle to etch some rough area um, around, around it. Uh, Copernicus, also in that book. Um, it was nice to draw a crater. It is, it is actually really nice to draw a crater, um, especially on the Terminator there, where you can see the sun is clearly shining on the on the walls of the crater and um, and on the tiny craters around it, and on the mountain in the middle, you can see a little kind of click of sun on the top of it. Um, as I said earlier, like. You know, when the sun is rising, you're you're gaining, um, you're gaining light in the crater, and when the sun is not rising, you're you're losing light. So, in some incidents, incidents, the shadows inside the craters 
can be very impactful when you're doing a drawing, like Plato, you know, the, the that crater that, that has um, fabulous flame, like dark shadows, like flickering flames when you're drawing, when you're drawing it. Um, yeah, I really, really like it. I, I've done several drawings of Tycho, you know, with, with the, the rays, um, the ejector rays going up, going up for a thousand miles across the moon. And, and, but eventually actually I ended up doing a very large painting of Tycho, which hangs upstairs here in this house, three foot three by three foot three. It looks really impactful. I can say impactful, um, for sure. Um, Probably this was one of the most drawings I've done that gave me the biggest surprise because um, it was done in the, you know, I think it was in and around five o'clock, half past five, coming up to six o'clock in the winter time. I did the drawing on the 1st of December um, in, in a place called Greystones in County Wicklow on a side road with a bunch of guys who were there trying to photograph it when I was drawing it. Um, and, you know, it was a, a Venus occultation, you know, Venus is just there on the, on the limb on the left. And I had to draw what I could of the moon, what I could see of it in, in you know, semi brightness um, before waiting for Venus to, you know, for the moon to move on and Venus to pop out the other side. And I, I, I somebody had sent me, um, actually was Sally Russell sent me beautiful velour paper, which is like velvet, and it absorbed the pastels so well. And there was a lot of cloud around, so that's what the drawing looks kind of milky. You know, the sky was kind of milky, and you're seeing the moon in and out of the cloud, and then you have your Venus come along. And you're waiting for that moment, waiting for that moment to kind of pierce Venus almost into it with a white Conte crayon, you know, a white Conte stick and make it stand out like a dazzling thing and a dazzling thing it certainly was that day. And I put that drawing into Space Weather, you know, Space Weather, um, uh, you can upload drawings and upload photographs of the sun or Mars or whatever, whatever the thing at the moment, Aurora or whatever. And I put that up, um, I might have put it up that day, I can't remember. And then I got an email from NASA saying, we'd like it to be astronomy picture of the day. And I couldn't believe it, you know. And uh, and and then they said that some professional astronomer was going to write a, a bit of blurb to go with it and blah, blah. And then... Um, and that was it. It was up on the 6th of December, and I was absolutely amazed. And somebody else informed me that it was only the third drawing in the history of APOD that, um, or the third time that a drawing had been honoured in that way. So I was absolutely chuffed altogether. It was brilliant. Brilliant fun. Uh, with Nebula, um, I use soft pastel, but I use. Um, those cotton buds, do you know, I don't know in America whether you call them cotton buds, but uh, people do things with their ears with them and stuff like that. Um, what I do with them, what? Cotton swabs. Yeah. What I do with them, -tip. yeah. What I do with them is I, I, this is M42 in the Sword of Orion, which, uh, you know, this was done from when I lived in Bray, which is uh, quite a large town in County Wicklow. So, you know, there was a large supermarket across the road and there was a lot of light pollution. And that particular night in 2007, it was probably like a really good night in suburbia, like for looking at M42. So I drew in the stars. I use um, things called gel pens, white gel pens. They're, they contain white ink and they're, they're gorgeous and you can get them in different point sizes. So you're putting in your stars with your gel pens. And then I use the cotton buds to spread the pastel in the shape that I see of the gas in the in the nebula. And then you can, you know, use your greys and then you can pop a bit of white on top. You see there where where the where the cloud of gas and dust has some brightness, little 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 pop out brightness as you can 
just place it in and rub it and blend it till till it looks like what you're looking at and and and, and uh, until you're happy with it you know so i was happy enough with this drawing i think i did three or four drawings of of uh, m42 with my eight inch dog in uh, suburbia and then uh, a friend of mine said to me would you like to come down to my observatory he had a 16 inch mead a chap called michael o'connell we had to go there so i said absolutely i'd be delighted so off i went down to count to kildare there's about a couple of hours drive from my house went into michael's observatory had a look at a few things had a look at m42 and nearly had a heart attack because the complications of going from an eight inch dot in a bright light polluted town to a semi-rural place with with a 16 inch was just phenomenal i nearly keeled over because the detail was ridiculous and i i was kind of looking at it going i don't have no idea how i can get this onto a piece of paper but like i sort of just said i'm here i'll do it now i'll get going and uh, so i i got all my bits and pieces see it was so detailed it was so gobsmacking um i was astonished and i would love to do it again i really would love to do it again in in a large telescope in a dark place so um i haven't done it here now and i do live in a much darker place now but um hopefully this winter um i'll uh, get out there and and grab it because it's a spectacular, spectacular uh, birthplace of stars. Um, and especially when you're looking at it and you're thinking it's so far away and it's so powerful, you can see with your eyeball, which I think kids like when I tell kids, you can see with your eyeball. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a bucket list thing to do another one, uh, maybe in a bigger telescope. Um, that's my dog there behind. And this is not such a good image of the stars that I would put in for to draw. Uh, when you're looking at patterns of stars, in my opinion anyway, and the way I would do it, and this is just a graphic, it's not what I would draw. It's just to kind of get your head around doing, looking at the patterns. Like if you're trying to draw um, a particular thing, to look at the patterns of stars, to look at the patterns that the stars make within your field of view. Like spot a triangle, you will spot another one, then you'll spot another one, then you'll spot a triangle within a triangle. And each each triangle that you place a star in a triangle, and you keep looking and you'll see more. For some reason, the patterns give you the accuracy to produce a better drawing. Um, so this is drawing M M42 using the cotton bud there. Um, and I place the stars in, as I say, with the gel pens and then ap apply the nebula after that. So that's the, the finished drawing um, that I did. That was for um, Sky at Night as well, Sky at Night magazine. Meteor showers. Now, I, I, this is actually, I think, one of the first meteor showers that I actually drew when I lived in in Bryan County, Wicklow. So this is in 2010. So that, that you can see just in the bottom right there, that would be the roof and the guttering of my house at the time. And in the foreground at the bottom is some roses that we had grown up at Pergola. And above that are some kind of summery or what do you call it late summer clouds with still a little color in them and then perseus above that and um you can see then the different um colors that i would have seen in the meteors now this would be a sort of a composite sketch like i didn't go out and see all those meteors in suburbia in one night um well, the piece, the piece of paper I used that that day was quite large. It was about A2, and um, 
So I would go out and I would just, you know, look in the same exact same direction each night I would go out, right? So for between the 28th of July and August 10th, in various conditions, um, I would go out and just stand and look and see what I could see, but only in that section where I kind of corralled myself by drawing the house and drawing the rose bushes. So only in that section of sky is my game, if you like, to draw the meteor share and to then to draw the colors. But what I was actually doing was drawing um, in pencil on a white piece of paper and then transferring it the next day onto a black sheet of paper. But I would write down all the colors of them and whether they had uh you know like that kind of uh, mars code kind of dot dash kind of a meteor or whether they had like spurting cloudy deposits coming out of them um all that kind of detail in the pencil drawing so that i could you know reproduce it the next day in color um or when i was going to put it together when i had time to get it all together um uh, this is 2015, um, again it's in Bray, County Wicklow, and you can see Perseus there, um, just sort of just off centre there, and Cassiopeia above that, and um, and the meteors that I saw um, on a particular evening, and you know when you're when you're looking for the Perseus meteor share, and you're looking for the meteors, and you don't see any for like half an hour or something, but satellites go by. So I started drawing in the satellites with blue lines and a little kind of arrow showing the direction they were heading in. Heading in. And then um, the kind of ropey looking ones that had the, the meteors that had some dust and gas and stuff coming off them as they whizzed past in the sky. I just thought it was one thing to do. Um, Comet 17P Holmes. Now, that was something else. That was in 2007. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine, John Franner, who was saying, have you seen it yet? And I said, no. So he said, go out the back. And I took my 15 by 70 binoculars, went and had a look in the direction he told me. And there I seen it. So do you see the brighter dot? in the circle there in the field of view. That is my first view of 17P Holmes. And that was on the 24th of the 10th, 07. And this was Comet Holmes on the 28th of the 10th, 07. And it went from being that tiny little dot to being this mad looking, interesting, fabulous, huge thing. It became, one of the largest objects in the solar system and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and the tail um i believe at the time was not really visible it was behind what we are seeing we were seeing a kind of face on and it, as it got bigger it got thinner and thinner and thinner and i was getting phone calls from fellas from all over the place saying it's breaking up it's breaking up because they could see dots other dots within the coma but you see the dot out to the edge there near on the on the left at the bottom that what was going on was it was getting so thin that you could see stars that were in space behind it shining through the thinness and in this particular drawing i was kind of fascinated by it because it looked like spokes on a wheel there was kind of deep deep um, deep material and then thinner material, uh, like a bicycle wheel. And I kind of, in my head, I'm kind of going, that looks like it's spinning. And then a couple of days later, there were articles and whatever all over the internet and whatever that it was indeed spinning. And I was kind of delighted then that I'd kind of captured that uh, in a drawing. And at, at just the very last image. Our very last drawing um, I did of 17 P Holmes when it was kind of just disintegrating or something or turning into something um, quite odd looking. Um, and that was the last time I've seen it. But I did all these I did all these drawings of it 
um, between October 24th and December 4th. So it just shows you like just the unusual changes um, that went that this comet went through. Um, and I hope it, it kind of brightens up again and, uh, and, and we have another go because, you know, comets are, you know, they are like cats um, and they actually do exactly what they want. But that's that's the nice thing, isn't it? You know, um, because you can really kind of you're really observing, aren't you? You're not just kind of thinking you're observing. You're really seeing something happening. Sometimes with that particular comet, there was thing, you know, there was changes being made you know, within an hour, like within an, one hour of, of observing, it had changed again and changed again. Um, so it was really active, which I really like, because a lot of things that we look at um, in the night sky are the same, you know. They don't, the, the sun does an awful lot of changing, um, but like your planets and whatever, you might get an occultation, that kind of thing, but the planets itself are not really changing. You're not seeing anything terribly obvious most of the time but I like things that change because then you can record them. Um, I, I, this particular drawing that that actually ended up in uh, Sky and Telescope magazine I was delighted in 2020. This island is a direct line outside um, my door basically uh, about, it's about seven kilometers away across the across the, the sea and um, I could I did about 10 drawings I think naked eye drawings of uh, Comet Neowise in 2020 as it was I knew it was going to end up above the island and I was just hoping that that particular evening would be clear and I could see it so I felt very lucky um, because like this is like quite late at night um, I can't remember, it was definitely after midnight. You know, uh, well over here when, you know, when the sun goes down in, in June and it um, has been a nice day, you get that kind of sunset colors lingering like quite late, like way past midnight. And, uh, you know, at the bottom of the island there, you know, where my signature is, that's, that's the Atlantic Ocean. And then there's a little kind of grouping of light where there's like uh, some habitats, if you like, and then at the end of the island, then there's a, a harbour. So it's nice to see those twinkling at night. And I wondered, did the people on the island look up? And I did put it all on Twitter, so they, they they could, and I, you know, hashtagged them and all that. But that particular night, the comet did look like a an exclamation mark, just kind of hanging over the island. And I did draw as it approached, through, some through the telescope and, and some naked eye, as it approached and moved down along the length of the island and um, became uh, invisible shortly after that. So um, I have a video now which runs for about five minutes. Would it be okay to show that? Sure. Sure. Okay. So. It just give you um, an idea, like of how you might go about drawing uh, a meteor shower. It's um, it was kind of intended for for um, children, but it, it doesn't really matter. Anybody could have a go. At least if you did try and you did it in colour, you know, you'd have something to put in your in your record of, of it as opposed to a lot of writing, you know what I mean? Not hearing the audio, or at least I'm not hearing the audio. Yeah, mine's it's low too. Say, Deirdre, we're not hearing yeah. the we're not hearing the audio on this. Side. Okay. Um, how do I correct that for you? Hmm. You might want to just put on captions if you can do that. Uh, uh, I don't think so. It's a it's a YouTube video 
incorporated into the PowerPoint. Oh, I see. Um, so I'm not, I don't think I have any control here for it. I could, I could link the YouTube video itself. Um, okay. It's on my YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. Go on there now. And it's drawing the Perseid meter share. I think it might be up one of the first ones up there somewhere. All right. So I posted her YouTube and drawing the Perseid meter shower. There it is. All right. I am posting it in chat. So I'm going to watch that on this side. Well, it's there if people want to watch it, I guess. Yep, I think I'll go. I'm going to copy this. And... Yep, I'd love to watch it. Uh, yep, I see it. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure if people are watching it or do you want to ask me questions or if anybody has any questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm actually, actually. watching it now. <laughs> but I'll wait. Derrida, when did you start drawing? Was that before or after you got into astronomy? Oh, I've I've been drawing since I was about four. Uh, my mother kept drawings when I was in primary school, <laughs> and I still have some of them. <laughs> uh, I've been drawing all my life. It's um, it's just in me. I I always have something on the go. You know. Um, it's just a thing. Um, I, but I, I've always been interested in astronomy in particular. You know, I started really my big thing in astronomy when I was allowed to stay up to four o'clock in the morning to see Armstrong land on the moon. And uh, I got a telescope in December 1969, um, a little small 50 millimeter telescope. And uh, then over the years, I got a um, slightly bigger ones and then I had three children so all that kind of stopped <laughs> and then you know when they grew up and left the nest I I, I went back to college and um, did lots of various things uh, communication being one of them um, and we had to give a presentation about something we really loved so I gave a presentation about the Milky Way and uh, didn't want to stop <laughs> And then I went to college and, and did uh, I went to UCD and did communication there. And um, yeah, um, I, you know, when I got into the Saturn observation campaign um, thing, uh, the American thing, um, the, the person that I was dealing with there, Jane Houston John, she, <clears throat> she did some astronomical drawing and was kind of a new thing to me. I'd never really come across it. So. Um, I decided I was going to give it a go, so I did a lot of trying with the moon and pencil. And uh, I did several drawings of M42 and things like that with pencil, but I was never happy with them because they were on white paper with pencil. So I switched to what I see, the black background, with lots of gray, <laughs> lots and lots of gray. And, uh, yeah, I, I kept going on that. Um, so it's quite it's a long time drawing, but you know, did the lofty astronomy with the drawing together around about 2006, I think. So there weren't any pictures of the moon you drew when you were eight on the uh, on the refrigerator. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, pictures of my mother, pictures of sitting under a table or something like that. I don't know what they were really. Pictures of the clothes on the line, things like that, you know. 
but uh, like when I was a teenager, I used to do do a lot of painting and drawing, um, making things, you know, the pottery, stuff like that. And uh, when I was older, I, I, I actually worked as a graphic designer um, for many years, doing magazines and things like that. Um, I did several drawings of movie stars for people who wanted a drawing of a movie star. <laughs> Um, yeah. So is any of your astronomical art hanging anywhere right now? Um, Red Guy asked me to send him a solar drawing and he was going to put it in um, a, a sort of an educational place in the Vatican somewhere. Um, it, it, I, I kind of have moved, I've moved in, I, I, for a while I moved into pencil drawing of active regions because I wanted to just capture, was so much I couldn't put in pastel because of the complications. So I kind of went back to simpler drawing using soft pencil, like pencil, and those uh, silicon tipped brushes for spreading it. So it, it enabled me to capture more of the shapes that the fibrils align themselves in when they're, you know, when they're magnetically drawn uh, around the umbra and penumbra of sunspots. Like the, the shapes are gorgeous um, and they're organized by magnetic so energy. What kind of telescope you know, so are you I using for that? Pencil. Sorry? What kind of telescope what are you time? using uh, for that? You said you're drawing active regions. Are you are you still using the PST? Yeah, I'm using the PST. Yeah, yeah, PST. No, sorry, I'm using um, my eight-inch dab with a white light filter. Ah, okay. For, for that, I haven't hadn't got on the other um, I I thought I had too much in the presentation as it was. Should I stop <laughs> sharing now? <laughs> yeah, that that that's so fine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now there you are. Yeah. Um, anybody else have questions yeah, for Deirdre? Yeah. Has anybody else got questions? Are you going to try and draw something? Uh, I got some questions. Um, I'm also an artist. I uh, for, did that for a living. Uh, yeah. Uh, mostly stuff on illustration board, gouache. Um, oh, yeah. And my favorite medium for doing, I, I did astronomical stuff, but it was science fiction. Uh, so my stars were basically spread on the board using uh, paint from a toothbrush, where you you oh, rub yeah. the toothbrush and you can get yeah. star patterns from random. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then uh, my favorite medium for quickly drawing was uh, a dark Strathmore paper and uh, yeah. Prismacolor white Prismacolor pencils. Because uh, I could get sharp uh, edges, and I can use the side of the pencil to get the smooth. Uh, and the Strathmore paper had a texture to it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the uh, illustration board doesn't. It, it's deliberately not got any texture to yeah. it. So that would be for a different yeah. reason. But um, I, I, I guess I, I kind of have a request. Yeah. And the request is this, that you do a drawing of Andromeda as you would see it, you know, through maybe the, the uh, binoculars or through um, a small telescope mm -hmm. and have the moon and another land object within the view. And then um, do a um, overlay on it where you have the actual uh, astronomical photos that they do of of uh, Andromeda, and, and the the idea yeah. there is that when you it, it, Andromeda is the furthest object you can see with your eye, sure. and yeah. it it's a it's a small fuzzy patch, but if I understand rightly, when you see the actual um, astrophotography, 
uh, and it's that beautiful spiral. That beautiful spiral is huge. It, it, yeah. it, you don't see it when you see it with your eye. You see yeah. that small central yeah. blob. Yeah. So uh, it 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 would give uh, me anyhow an impression yeah. of when I see that small blob that there's that invisible halo that's huge around it. That's what you really yeah. see when you see those yeah. photographs. Yeah, I I I'm gonna I'll have a look at that during the winter from here. I'm not sure if I could put a physical object in front of it because it's kind. It would be hanging out over over fields you know over the land you know like yeah I, well that, I that's why i've been 44 um recently for the vatican uh blog but yeah and 4 was rising over a, a mountain you know so it was you know there was a, a kind of a physical thing to compare it to you know what I mean? right right because so, um, if you have, if you I, have a picture of the moon um there you you can um it, it, it's a solid scale. So if you have a uh, a picture of the moon in your drawing from what you saw that was near, and then you actually get the photograph, the photograph of Andromeda, you could measure the scale to the moon because you know All how right. many degrees just, the moon uh, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because then then you get an idea that when you actually see that very faint blob with your naked eye, you're you, you know the 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 beautiful spiral you see in those photographs is yeah. is huge compared to that. Yeah, um, yeah. and that that's just fascinating to me. Is that it's all, I, I if I remember rightly, it's almost as big as the moon. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I find that fascinating. Anyhow. I posted a link in chat yeah. of uh, ESA uh, image of Andromeda. It's zoomable. It's it's uh, 1.5 billion pixels. They're saying you'd need 600 HD television screens to display it. You can. Wow. It's it's ridiculous. It, it's uh, yeah. I, I've stared I've stared at this image for like an hour before. <laughs> but so have have fun. I with think that, I everyone. remember that it's, image it's too. Amazing. I looked at it and there was so many stars in it it's like well yeah. it's a galaxy <laughs> if you have kids in your astronomy club do you have kids in your astronomy club i had kids in my astronomy club yes yeah. well, like you should try and get them into doing a bit of drawing because it gives them great confidence you know even I, if it's only a piece of white I'm, paper on the clipboard and a pencil you know? Glad you brought that up. My wife is a uh, middle school science teacher, and a couple of years ago, that is one of the things that she had her students do. She, I uh, had yeah. my telescope there, and she had them, um, she had them draw the moon as they saw it. Um, yeah. First, first time they ever did it, they were look, they were all pretty dreadful, but they did it right. So they did that's it. What, yeah. That's yeah. What's yeah. important. Yeah. So it's their, yeah, it's their, their achievement. You got to start somewhere. You gotta start somewhere, and just while you can see what I have, these are the gel pens, white gel pens. You know, they're they're lovely. They the, the ink flow is lovely out of them. You know, I've been I've been linking them. stuff in chat as you've been talking, and I did I did find some gel pens on Amazon. I'm not sure if they're the right yeah. ones, but yeah, I, did I got that. these from Amazon. They're there's, called, um, there's two different Signa, types. Uniball Signa. Uniball uh, Signa. There's... Yeah, there's there's two different types different of gel colors. pens. So if you were to put in your stars for a constellation in your gel, in your white gel pen, and one of the stars was red or orange, then you just simply get your orange gel pen. You put you've already put it in the white, and then you pop the orange over. It. Do you know? Because you, you, mm -hmm. you if you put red or orange on a black piece of paper, you're it's probably not going to be that obvious. But if you've already put a white dot and then you put the color over it. Then it stands out. You know what I mean? So you can add in your beetle juice and your Rigel and Aldebaran, right. or whatever. You know the coloured stars. You can uh, include them in in that kind of drawing. You know. Do you use Do you use two different types when you do that? Like um, there's oil based, and then there's uh, uh, latex water based. I don't know what they're based on, really. Um, I just love them. I was thinking if you put the oil-based one first and then the water on top of it, yeah. um, you'll get less spread or mix. Yeah, so I don't know. So you get a whiteness right inside that, that other color. 
these are just great because they don't they don't make they make the blob you want them to make you know what i mean yeah. you down, if you lean on it you can get like a maybe slightly larger one if you just lightly lean you get your dimmer star so you can create dimmer stars by just a light touch you know uh -huh. um, yeah so like they're they're marvelous for that kind of thing you know but, um, yeah at the moment Although i'm I, doing I, I, I was having a hard you know time finding person? the thin ones <laughs> do you know who this is i think i know who that is who is it would be a uh, one uh albert einstein Happy one, Albert Einstein. Dave, he only has Bailey. one eye at the moment. He, he's only got one eye at the moment because I haven't finished him. And his his uh, his forehead is really very detailed. <laughs> it's full of crevices and uh, yeah. And uh, I, I'm gonna make something special out of him for him. I'll let you know. <laughs> That's a beautiful start. <laughs> what it will be. It's not a bad start, yeah. I think I have to do some more work on his chin and his forehead. I've never seen such a cracky forehead in my life. <laughs> a lot of so, thought uh, had a, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of thinking going on in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, thanks for listening to my talk. I hope it uh, gave you some insight into. Oh. Thank you. That was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Because uh, like I, 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 I could have spoke for an hour on the sun or the moon or any of the other um, aspects of it, um, uh, but I thought just a bit of an overview might do. Well, it. I, I I hope it prods at least one of our membership to uh, go ahead and start start doing that. I'm expecting to see some drawings coming coming in this direction. <laughs> I I've always been doing science fiction stuff, so. Yeah. Actual re real looking through a telescope and then trying to draw it. I've never done that. But yeah, yeah. So I've been to a fun. science fiction convention. I think we need to talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think too many people have the solar telescopes, though. So, you know, uh, um, I do. Like I, I got the same oh, one. Yeah, yeah. And Diane does too. Uh, I have that exact oh, wow. one. Wow. Yeah. Well, I got I got a white light filter for the job, so. And it works on the mead as well. It, it fits on that as well. So um, that but there was really nice active region there in April, and I did manage to get a drawing of it, even despite the big wind we had. I was um, actually yeah. in the market to get a better something. I, I think my PST's finally given out on me, and, and I do have to relate a story. My wife looked through a lunt, either a sixty or an eighty, at Alcon 2012, and she oh, wow. said, and I quote. Oh, Bob, this is so much better than yours. You got to get one of these. And so <laughs> I think it's time for me to do that because you, you could see you could see uh, granulation on the surface. Surface features are uh, amazing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be a fantastic sketch when you get it done, Bob. <laughs> that would be the reason to buy it. Yes, I must it be, yeah, it. So yeah, there yeah, I need yeah. a better scope so I can sketch it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. So, any other questions or comments for Deirdre? And I've linked her. Uh, I've linked her uh, YouTube channel in the in the chat, and uh, you can see her videos there. And uh, she's got a website, and she's on and she's on Twitter, so you can follow her there. That sounds great. Um, regarding Einstein's wrinkles, I would say, you know, when they, when they talk about the brain, the more wrinkles, the, the more intelligent you are, right? <laughs> Maybe so it's a reflection uh, of the brain so, on the outside. So as soon as we get older, we get more intelligent because we got more wrinkles. <laughs> yes, yes, wiser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the other, the other thing that comes to mind is, uh, where you live at, and that is that, um, the latitude of Detroit um where we're at is pretty much the same latitude as rome oh no it's all right not really yeah yeah, yeah so um i i remember li when i i lived in england for a little bit when i was young and it uh, in the uh, winter it would be dark for a long time and in the summer yeah. it would be bright like you said yeah. way past midnight and that that's something yeah. that right really doesn't get 
so yeah we're coming um, up to the solstice now so the the sun actually goes down just just to the left of clare island the island that's just uh, out the window there and the one um, you drew the one i'm not jealous then, of you know, at all. You know, sorry it, it's a, that beautiful island that one that you uh, have a view of one i'm not jealous yeah. of at all no no <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The sun goes down left to the left of that on the 21st. And then after that, in increments like this, like to the left, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And there's two other islands and it goes to the left of Inishbotten. So there's several kilometers in between. So it's real obvious. You don't when, when you're on the East Coast, you don't see that. When you're here, it's real obvious the distance, hmm. you know, the distance between uh the shortest day and the longest day and the, the solstice both solstice really obvious <laughs> and also it doesn't it gets dark here i think it's about 20 minutes difference or thereabouts between when the sun goes down here and when the sun goes down on the east coast in dublin <laughs> i don't hmm. think that's fun. <laughs> myself it's just something you notice when you're living in a different coast you know do you, do you see a lot of aurora borealis where you're at? I haven't yet myself, but other people have. Um, I thought I took a picture of it. Um, I think it was in March um, from a beach that's about three miles from my house. And I missed mm -hmm. it. I mean, it was like at silly o'clock or whatever. And he, he was just lucky. Um, and there was alerts, you know, there was, you know, you get alerts from space weather uh -huh. about right. like the aurora yeah, level and being down and this yeah. neck of the woods. And you get the little alert and I got some apps at the time, but it was cloudy. So, you know, uh -huh. otherwise I'd be, be kind of like outside just waiting, <laughs> Do you know. Right. Um, I, I, I was in Iceland one time um, many years ago. We went to Iceland and we went on what was called an aurora tour, like one of the tours was to bring us out to where you would look at the aurora so it was uh, astonishing because it was midnight or post midnight it was it was december anyway or was it december yeah it was early december we went and um we got out of the bus and the kids back you know he just kind of pointed over and we kind of looked and it was behind a cloud what the, it was it was like up the clouds like as if it was a, a like a, a newborn star in a nebula you know hmm. the star the whole cloud was 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 lit up by it and um and on another night we were walking um into Reykjavik and we could see it over Reykjavik you know it was just amazing and then when on, when when the plane took off to bring us home I saw that 35,000 feet out my window oh, wow. I was looking down on it. It was like really weird, you know. <clears throat> and it was yeah. that lovely green, beautiful green particles uh, in the atmosphere. Yeah, I, I've only seen it really once. And uh, the thing that I recall about it was that um, photographs don't do it justice. I think a drawing would do it a lot more justice I than a photograph. Love that. Yeah, because I would they love move so fast and they're so faint. So yeah. you could you could draw all the little things that you see happening in it, um, yeah. and yeah. I you think probably wouldn't would get that it. in the photograph. Absolutely, it would be the business now that would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and from where Clare, where Clare Island is, then behind that is another island called Ackle Island, and it's in that direction that the aurora mm. hang out. If it's going to hang out at all, that's the direction. So. Um, I should be able to see it if it ever happens, and it's clear, and I get my space weather alert and, and run outside. You know? um, but then, of course, some people can see it, you know. But then they take the, their photographs, and then they enhance the photographs, and it's, your eye, your eyes are not going to see like the amount of enhancement that's put in the photographs, you know. Yeah. You know, like. Well. So I, I remember I when I looked at it, it was like smoke. It was really detailed. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, ho hopefully, hopefully, if you do see it, you'll get to see Steve. <laughs> if you have ever heard of that. 
No. Uh, the it it's a uh, apparently it's like uh, sprites that they've oh, been finding yeah. above. Oh, it's a uh, an odd form of yeah. aurora that has a, a comb like structure to it. Yeah, very transient. Oh, very yeah, transient. it's yeah. yeah, it's very transient and it's very faint and very detailed. It's exactly what wow. you'd want yeah. to draw rather than yeah. photo. That um, would be like a, an atmospheric thing I'd love to draw. That's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But like I was so, so lucky to with Comet Neo eyes that it was visible. Um, it was summertime, so I wasn't freezing, <laughs> and um, yeah. and it was very clear, very very clear. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get another nice comet soon, especially one that you can see. Well, thank you for including <laughs> Comet Holmes because I absolutely love that comet, and I feel it's a so did I deeply deep yeah. underrated comet. It was magical watching it. Wasn't it? It was just amazing. It was it was an extraordinary expansion that was happening like right in front of your eyes. How long was, was that comet visible for? And well, I think uh, I was over well over a month. Well over a month. I, I have to go back to my slide there to look at the the timings. Um, but I did about twenty eight drawings. I, you know, like I, I, I'm, I got to see it most of the nights, so I think I had about twenty-eight drawings in the in the block there. That was using um, your eight-inch dab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the first drawing was through uh, fifteen by seventy binoculars. I actually did buy at one stage twenty-five by one hundred binoculars, but they were so heavy. So heavy. <laughs> yeah, I, I bought a mount for those. Yeah, I I I had them on a, a pretty decent tripod, and then one of the little one of the legs, you know, the little closing things on the leg, it wasn't quite closed, and they had a little kadunk, <laughs> and a, a guy was to fix them for me, and he has them about two and a half years, so <laughs> I'm still curious whether they ever got fixed or where they are. Um, I get them back at some point. Yeah, but they're very, very heavy. I, I, I'm not even sure I want them back. The 15 by 70s are much more handleable, especially on a tripod. Obviously, because um, yeah, the other ones were like extremely heavy. You know, do you ever yeah. see those ones where they're all joined together, like the the two oculars are joined together, and it's massive tripod holding the thing up. I love one of them. <laughs> yes, I have yeah. a buddy who has one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's great. It's it's it's. I'm 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 intending to do more drawing this year for sure because you know telescopes getting heavy to lift out, <laughs> like the Mead. Um, uh, it's a heavy. It's about thirty five pounds in weight to lift out and. Um, my husband usually struggles out with it and sets it up for me, <laughs> um, but it is, it's getting quite heavy, but, um, and it, you know, like it's grand when it goes to one part of the house, it's easy enough to get in and out, but it depends on what you're going to look at then, you might need to move it further away and it just weighs a lot, but the views are fabulous in it, you know, yeah. it's the uh, LX90, yeah. So we're heading up on the, uh, on the end of the end of the show here, uh, but I have a question for you. Well, are you going to any like astronomical uh, conventions or anything like that in the in in the near future? Myself, I'm I I don't know. Um, I don't. I actually don't know. I don't know what's happening in that area here because you know the COVID thing kind of knocked a lot of uh, in person meetings on the head. Um, yeah, I did, it does. You know, like, yeah, I did a bit of outreach there about, when was that, early in March, early in May, it was about six weeks ago, um, there was an IAU uh, symposium um, in the Midlands of Ireland, 
So I was asked to do some uh, outreach to schools near the venue. So um, I did um, a workshop I have uh, called The Magical Story of Stars. So that went well. Um, but I didn't meet too many people because there was an awful lot of scientists at it. There was 230 scientists at it. I think I met and spoke to about two of them because I just wanted to keep to myself because of the whole COVID thing. <laughs> and I was doing in person in the school for the first time for two and a half years. So that felt a bit spooky. <laughs> but I was okay. Everything went fine. Um, and the kids did some. We, I was getting them to draw M42 from one of my drawings, but not in grey. I got them to draw it in any colour they liked. So I got some quite fashion, like almost fashionable M42s. <laughs> um, but, it, it, you know, because I had I got this gigantic photograph from the European Space Agency a few years back, and eight foot by five foot photograph of the Carina Nebula in colour, a uh, Hubble Space Telescope photograph. And I brought that and the kids helped me roll it out. And so then like they could see all the colour and I was just telling them that the colour represents the elements in the nebula. And, you know, in the nebula stars are born and there's elements in stars and they end up in you <laughs> and in the planet you're st sitting in and walking around in. and in your whole life, they're, you know, they're there and uh, they really got into it and, and then they did drawings where I was getting, trying to get them to express the power of star formation in the nebula by using powerful colours and powerful shapes, as well as putting the, the four stars, the, the trapezium in the middle, just, that was important. <laughs> and they wrote the birthplace of stars. I'll write a blog for the for the um, for the Vatican thing. Um, I just haven't got around to it yet because I I kind of have a a list of drawings that I'm doing, and I want to get them done because they're in my head. I don't know whether you, anybody else gets like that. You get an idea for a, a drawing or a painting, you just have to do it. And if you don't do it in the time. When it's in your head you kind of lose the momentum but you know some of them do come back and they kind of bother you till you do it <laughs> that's all i can say about drawing it's kind of um okay well it's 9 32 here we have to wrap it up it yep, is well, 2 38 here thank you very much oh, <laughs> thank you so thank much you for joining so us so much okie dokie take care all right everybody all right. have a good night and we'll see you uh maybe at the open house Thank you, Diane, Bob, and everybody else. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Yeah. Good night, everyone. All right, good night. Night. Good night, night. night all. Take care. The last ones are going to be here. Good night.